What's up everybody? Welcome. I'm back. If you came on Tuesday and I wasn't here, I apologize. I was here. I was near the, the studio, unconscious and bleeding. <laughs> I'd had a, a procedure, a, a surgical thing done as an emergency and I wasn't feeling good. And I, I kind of slept when I was supposed to be getting ready and by the time I was ready I couldn't do it. So that's why I didn't do it. Uh, it was a thing uh, in my mouth and it's fixed and all is well. Uh, so uh, back to normal and uh, we're going to be playing catch up today. In fact today is the very first of our new monthly series. I'm going to do this every month on each channel, on each uh, of, of our uh, programs, Tuesday and Thursday. We're going to do a monthly mailbag. Can you hear me, by the way, loud and clear, presumably? I hope so. Somebody let me know uh, in um, Telegram, possibly. There we are. Got that up and running. So uh, we're going to call this thing, um, I don't know, the monthly mailbag I came up with. We could call it the MMB or um, we could call it just the bag. So it's really for your questions, which is what this thing started out as anyway. Somebody suggested a couple of weeks ago that we, that we do this so that there can be a focus time where all of the questions that come in that I haven't got to answer at other times can get answered all in one place. And that's, that's the idea. That's what we're going to do. Um, and uh, today is just a slight exception to that in that, um, well, quite, quite a big exception actually, the mail app. Uh, the, the messaging app through the walls-app site is still not quite cooperating with me. I can't get into it. You can, and you can leave messages, but I can't open the, the messages. I can't find any of the messages. Patrick's working on it. We're going to get it fixed. It's been just a bit fraught with uh, the time difference and everything, but I, I promise we're getting there. We're getting there. And uh, I've got something I want to talk to you about in a minute that, that may have a bigger impact even than, than the app. Uh, so the questions I'm going to be getting to today are questions that have come in other, other channels, stuff that came in through the live streams I didn't have a chance to answer, stuff that's come through uh, the mail in the past, uh, the stuff that people have asked me on the street. It doesn't matter. Any questions we'll, we'll get to. And today I've got some interesting ones I'm going to deal with. I've got far more to do today than I can possibly get to, so I will just try to get to as much of it as possible. I got a, a, a gift in the mail today. Two gifts, actually. Three, if you count the fact that one of them was double. Uh, I got two of these cute little motors that were given to me uh, with a little board on them. These things were ripped out of a bathroom somewhere. They're the thing that spray deodorant in the bathroom. And uh, they're, very, they're very fun. I've got mine hooked up to where it rings a bell. I don't know why, but it does it every 10 minutes and it scares me to death. It's going to be going off from time to time. Don't worry about it. But the other thing he sent me was... A large jar full of beetles. I've always wanted some of these. These are invasive, not these particular ones because they're dead. Uh, but uh, had they been alive, they would be invasive. And these are um, those oriental beetles, Japanese beetles is what they're called, I think. Um, uh, anyway, I've got a, several hundred of them and I'm going to be photographing them. And we might photograph one of them today. Well, we might not photograph it today, but we can prep it today. Uh, if we have time at the end. I'll, the, the reason I'm going to do that is I want to try out the new camera, which I can't get to stay on. I have to, I have to press a button to get it to come on, but when I do and it comes on, it's incredible. This is the Z8, by the way, uh, operating with the 105 macro lens. And I think you can see how incredibly sharp it is, even in video like this. These are going to be important because I am going to be talking a little bit later about how we test uh, a lens that we're checking out to see whether or not we want to buy it or keep it. And that is something that I was going to talk about on Tuesday. And we'll be talking about it a little bit today and loud and clear. OK, good. That's good to hear. So um, there are some questions already coming through. And uh, I'm going to take just a second before I launch into the next thing. Um, 
that I wanted to talk about and just make sure there's nothing super important that I need to be paying attention to right this minute. I see uh, that the chat's busy and um, you know I'm not allowed to look at it, so I'm, I'm looking at a boiled down version of it, uh, which is why I'm saying hi to everybody all at once. Hi everybody, welcome. And uh, let me see, um, Graham had a, a message. I'll uh, happily give a quick five-minute demonstration on, uh, during the Pazoom on Saturday of uh, how uh, to stably mount the Aleo Oregon and its quick change capability in a 40-second video. Consider it done. And that's a good reminder. There is a Pazoom, for those of you who are members of Patreon, we have a two-hour interactive uh, session every other weekend. And uh, this particular weekend, I have been able to arrange for Graham Carey to talk to us all about uh, the, the positioning of the uh, Leo Oregon system. It took me a lot of time and expense to do that, but it is done. So that'll be happening on, what, what Saturday at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, which is six hours. Again, we're back to six hours, I think. So at six o'clock in the evening, uh, no, it's not, four o'clock in the afternoon in uh, the UK. And... Uh, yeah, figure it out yourselves. It's 10 o'clock in the morning central time. Um, I've, I've lost my uh, chat thing. That, that's troublesome when, when that happens. Let me see if there's a way to get it back. N apparently not. Um, yeah, this is, this is uh, the one thing I really need to learn about, um, about how to do this particular thing. This um, telegram is how when, when you press a button, and uh, all the stuff, oh, there it is, it came back. All right, good, forget about it. And um, uh, could you articulate, uh, this is Graham Carey still, he's uh, monopolizing uh, the, the opportunity to get a question in and ask two. Uh, the answer to the first one is yes. Could you articulate how Sony's announcement of their new camera, the A9 III, uh, with a full global shutter will affect ultra macro photography? Uh, no, no, I will not. Um, but I will on Saturday. Uh, I have a conversation planned actually between now and Saturday when I'm going to discuss that question uh, with somebody who is knowledgeable about Sony more so than I. Uh, so that will be uh, part of the program also. You've nailed it. Two out of two so far. And um, from Angie, uh, mm, suggestion, creating a better group chat than Discord so we can all chat easier outside of this. I uh, have never been a big fan of Discord because of my advanced age. I don't understand it. I can't follow the, the conversations very well. And when I do go over there, I get completely lost uh, in what I'm supposed to be uh, uh, paying attention to. It, I'm not crazy about it. Uh, a lot of people feel the same way. But those people who do like it, like it a lot and, uh, and use it pretty frequently. Uh, so uh, I, don't, uh, I don't feel like the baby needs to be uh, thrown out with the bathwater, but at the same time, I would love to have uh, a second uh, place that we could, could do that. Possibly, possibly the best place to do that would be uh, uh, through the app. I'll need to talk to, um, maybe there isn't a capacity for that. Let me, let me talk to Patrick and get a few ideas. Is there a particular platform that you had in mind, Angie? Um, we could maybe chat after this and get some ideas. But yes, I'm, I'm certainly uh, willing to open up a second uh, uh, channel for conversation. And if that becomes more popular with my viewers, then uh, we can transition over. I'm absolutely fine with doing that. But we just have to see what people want to do. You know that the, the, the whole Discord thing appeared on its own basically i set up the account because somebody said you know what you should have a discord account where people can go talk to one another and i set it up but immediately got so busy with videos that i, I didn't get over there for a year or, or six months or something and then i went over there to see if i needed to do something to close it because i'd never been over there and there were already 400 members and they didn't need me so they probably won't need me <laughs> if, if I don't go over there. So I probably won't get rid of it. Uh, but um, yeah, this is something I need to discuss with people. So I'll get some advice and, and we'll talk about it again. But thanks for the, uh, uh, for the idea. How good is the Amscope 4X and 10X finite optics, uh, Alistair asks. The Amscope 4X is one of the best 
finite optics for the money that you can buy at 20 bucks or thereabouts. It is sharp and crisp. It operates at a fixed um, uh, tube length. It's bright and it's wonderful. It's a brilliant starter objective for anybody interested in 4X photography. The 10X is pants. It's rubbish. I would not buy it uh, uh, or use it for anything. It's just not a good optic. It is um, uh, just uh, uh, full of fringing and uh, uh, weird abnormalities and it's not bright. It's hard to get uh, anything in focus. It's just not a good, good alternative. If you're going to spend the money, get the, get the 4X and then go get a Nikon a CFI Plan 10X, which is a couple of hundred bucks. You have to save up for it, but it is infinitely superior. Uh, to, to this lens. I don't like the 10X at all. Um, and I have both of them. Okay, so we're just wondering if the discount on the Oregon is still available. I'm afraid it is not. Uh, it was a limited time, a limited number of, of uh, discounts were available. They were all snapped up right away and, uh, and they, are now, uh, they are now gone, I'm afraid. But I am constantly in conversation with, uh, with Leowa and uh, I don't know if there may be an opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to see something like that happen again in the future. I'm having Mr. Lee on. Mr. Lee is Leowa. He's the chief optical engineer and owner of that company. And he is coming on as a guest uh, to have a conversation with me that is going to largely focus on the developing uh, specialty of video macro which is very exciting, very exciting to me and a lot of folks who have an interest in this and uh, are particularly interested in seeing how the, the new um, uh, Leowa lens works, the 100 millimeter video macro lens. It's, uh, it's very similar to their 100 millimeter uh, f2.8 uh, 2x macro lens, only it has a de-clicked aperture ring so it smoothly changes between apertures. Uh, it also has a much longer focus throw so that you can fine tune your focus in real time. And uh, uh, it has some other, other features as well, but it's a, it's a beautiful lens, beautiful looking. And uh, I'm hoping to get my hands on a loaner of one of those so that I can get uh, comfortable with it before we do our January month, which is going to be video macro. At least one uh, episode of content each week in January will be focused on video macro and uh, there'll be a chance for us all to learn a little bit about it and uh, we'll have lots of examples and I'll do lots of demonstrations that type of thing so sorry about the Oregon situation uh, they, they were um, uh, they were uh, pretty specific at the beginning that there would only be a limited number and they they were all gone um, and Angie was thinking about Facebook and uh, offered to moderate it well I'll tell you what then uh, we'll get together we will set such up and then I will spread the word and, uh, and we'll get it going and see what happens. We can do nothing uh, more than that. Uh, what is the distance for the 4X AMSCO objective? Well, it's listed on the objective as 160. That is the length of the mechanical tube lens. The, uh, the, the actual distance that you need to separate the, um, the lens from your sensor by is 150 because we don't use an eyepiece when we're using the, the lens with a camera. So we have to take 10 off for that. Uh, so it's 150, 150 millimeters is the distance between the end of the knurling on the objective, the near end of the knurling around the, the barrel and the sensor. So you need to add together the physical length of your tubes and the flange focal distance of your camera. Uh, so if your flange focal distance is, say, 40 millimeters, none of them are, but it, it just say it was 40 millimeters, you'd need 110 millimeters of extension and then the objective. Okay, 150 total. And, um, and we have another moderator already for the new Facebook uh, book group, which um, uh, that's the fastest I think we've ever done anything. Uh, it's already done and we haven't even finished the introduction. So... Fantastic. Yes, that sounds great, Angie and Alistair. Uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, get it, the details taken care of and get some artwork up and start a, a thing and, and we'll chat. Uh, I was going to read you the note that came with my Beatles. It says, to the esteemed macro photographer, Alan C. Walls, from an adoring fan. 
which I thought was quite touching, until I realised it was from my son. <laughs> which, you know, I pay him to, to call me that, so uh, he, he would have to do that. So, very nice. Thank you, Joe. A very cool gift to receive on a Thursday morning. So let me see, uh, I was going to run through Tuesday's live, st uh, live stream and talk about how you evaluate a lens. I don't any longer have the lens in my possession because I returned it to the owner, uh, as I do when I'm, when I'm looking at a lens for somebody, I, I test it and then get it back to them. But I have all the pictures that I took and I thought I'd walk, walk you through the process of testing and explain how, how I do it and, uh, and look at the pictures. But we're gonna save that till the end because there's a couple of important things I need to do first. Um, do you want to hear any more details about my, my molar? No? Okay, well let's have, at least have a show of hands. Okay, no it is. And um, then, then we won't. Uh, though it is, a, it is one of the best excuses I've ever had for missing something, ever. Uh, it really w was a good excuse. Um, let me see. The live prep thing, yeah, we, we'll, we'll get to that if we can. I haven't even opened the jar. I do hope that that is alcohol he put it in and not something that would have allowed them to ferment. That would be, that would be terrible. Uh, we'll see if we have time for that. Okay, there are, um, there are two questions that I have for you. One of them is, is just a quick question. The other one's a big question. The quick question is this. I was donated a phone. And it works. It's an iPhone 10 or an X. It's two iPhones before my current iPhone, which is up there. I'll show <laughs> Are you confused? I'll show it to you. That's my current iPhone. It's up above me. Uh, but this is the, the one that was donated. And it works. And it works on Camo. Camo being the app that I connect the phone wirelessly to, to OBS with. Trouble is... When I connect this phone through Camo to the app, it disconnects that phone. And I need both phones as both inputs. Does anybody know how to do that? I've, I've contacted Camo with, with no response yet, and uh, there's got probably an app that would let you do that. Does anybody know what it is? Please tell me if you do. That was the short question. Um, but it would be great because I'd like to do, have, have one of them with a macro lens on it, for example, so that I can really show you close-up stuff. I could do that anyway, couldn't I? Just by taking that one down and putting a macro lens on it. This has only got one camera though, so it doesn't jump around sporadically between cameras, which is gonna make it easier for that. Anyway, I do go on, don't I? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, but hang on, let me see if that was an important message. Um, how about using a Raynox 50 with, uh, 150 with the uh, 4, uh, 4X Amscope objective? Uh, it's the physical distance between the Raynox and the, um, sorry, the physical distance between the objective and the sensor. It has nothing to do with focal length of a relay lens because this is a finite system. It does not require a relay lens. What a finite system is, is a microscope system whereby the lens and the, the a sensing device, which in most cases would be your retina, have a fixed length at which they operate. Now, you can use them at other lengths, but if you do, you lose the corrections that are built into the objective. In other words, the chromatic aberration corrections and the geometric corrections. If you start wandering short or long from that distance, the quality of the image drops. So we, we say that it is a finite objective, meaning that optically uh, it operates best at one particular distance from the sensor. It doesn't use a tube lens. There is no glass between the objective and the sensor. In infinitely conjugate systems, the objective puts out a, a parallel flux of light. Think of it as a, a column of light that, that is not diverging or converging at any point in the distance. It's, it's infinite, supposedly. It's not, but we'll say it is. In order to use an infinite objective, therefore, you need a second lens system that is going to take that parallel flux of light and focus it onto your sensor at some distance. Now, we typically will use 
uh, Raynox uh, uh, lenses for that, or the Thor Labs ITL 200 is another popular one. Uh, Mitutoyo makes tube lenses. Lots of people make tube lenses, and that's their function. And the reason you have that is it allows you to have a variable distance in between objective and tube lens into which you can put optical components like filters or uh, uh, mirrors or beam splitters. There's all kinds of things that you can put in that won't change the performance of the microscope but will allow you to do other things that you couldn't otherwise do with a finite scope. The uh, tube lens itself can have uh, uh, various different um, focal lengths and that will determine the magnification that you get out of the objective. Most of the time you want to use it at the nominal focal length for that objective. In other words, an objective is meant to be used with a focal length uh, a relay lens of a certain uh, 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 measurement. Like 200 millimeters is typically what the Nikon lenses, uh, what the uh, Mitutoyo uh, lenses use. So you would want a 200 millimeter objective, sorry, tube lens, like the ITL 200 or like the Raynox 150, which is close, 208 millimeters. And that will give you all of the correct corrections and a nice sharp image when you have the tube length, length tube lens situated properly within the tube. Now, a more advanced way of doing it is actually to get the tube lens and then focus the tube lens on infinity using a variable tube length until you can get it sharp and then put your objective some distance in front of that and that will give you the sharpest possible picture that is tuned for that particular tube lens. But yeah, that's the general idea. That's a big answer to a short question of what's, you know, what, what's the difference between the two, but it is so important. I see lots of people, I, I, I'm not telling on anybody, uh, but they'll, they'll buy a, an inexpensive finite 10X objective um, and they will put it on a, a, a Raynox tube lens and wonder why they're not getting really a picture at all. It's, it's because it's, it's not, those two components are not set up to use together. They are actually fighting against one another. So that's the deal. Um, and you want to get the best tube lens you can afford if you're using a nice objective. If you're using a, a $1,000 objective, don't use a, a, a cheapo tube lens. It, it doesn't make sense. Okay, all right. I'm gonna answer any, um, Vivian Daly said hi from Ireland. No, I'm not looking at the wrong thing. I'm not supposed to look at that. Sorry guys, uh, sorry Alistair, I broke the rules. It's because I was supposed to be looking at Telegram which has disappeared. Vivian, hi anyway. I need to talk to you about the clamps because they're still over there because I didn't give them away yet because there was a, a mix up. I'll explain another day. Uh, let me get back to a Telegram so that I can make sure I'm answering the questions I'm supposed to. Okay. So good, I'm up to date on the questions. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna step to the side from the normal flow of, of uh, activities because I need your full attention for something because this is a, a deadly serious thing that I want to talk to you about. And I'll make it quick and I will not belabor the point or repeat this again other than to remind you that I said it. I believe after five years of doing this that there is really one thing that stands between me and the kind of YouTube channel that I think we, we all deserve. Um, I, and I don't think it's uh, anything to do with programming or ideas or necessarily delivery or technical stuff. All of those things are involved, but I think there's a bigger thing that is, that is standing in the way. And that is simply not having the manpower to do everything that needs to be done to give me the time I need to produce the content you want. It, it's, it's hard to describe how crucial this piece seems to be. Um, I, I live on a, a knife edge of being able to get some of my mail answered and get the content that, that I want to put out, out 
and I, I never have enough time to do it all. And things suffer because of that. Now, there is nothing a YouTuber hates more, or may, maybe I should rephrase that, there's nothing a perfectionist hates more than putting out something substandard or putting out a, a live stream that has technical issues, that type of thing. I, I despise that. I also despise not answering uh, messages that have been composed and sent to me because somebody had a legitimate question they wanted to ask and I can't answer it because I don't have time to get to it. So we've, we're addressing that. We're addressing that with the Walls app and it's, it's not happening as fast as I would like but it's happening and we have some volunteers who are going to help screen the email. But there's still going to be a gap, a big gap, in what goes on that really has to be done internally. The stuff that goes on in my organization. And my organization consists of me. Now, the plan initially was, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, working from notes because I didn't want to miss anything. Uh, the, the plan always was that I would produce content, build an audience, uh, get enough people uh, interested in what I was doing uh, to, to get the numbers to where uh, sponsorship uh, would be possible. We'd get some cash flowing into the company. I'd be able to hire one or two people to do the work that consumes so much of my time and I would be able to continue to do the things that make the channel better and make the channel grow. I haven't been able to do that because I have never taken a paycheck from, from this. For five years, I have been putting money into this from, from my retirement and uh, uh, other, other sources of income, little jobs that I'd get to pay the way. Now, thank God, Patreon came along and uh, uh, the folks who've supported me both inside and outside of Patreon have filled a huge gap in there that have allowed me to eke out the, the remaining resources that I have to go this long. And we have gone five years, something like 600 videos now. We're up to, I don't know how many live streams we've done, but we've been doing it for more than a year. So it's like, 70 or something uh, uh, of each. So that's 140 live streams. That's a lot of content. And nothing pleases me more than being able to make good quality, tight content that you want, that, that gives you information that you need. And that's what I want to do, but I can't do it with everything else that needs to be done. Social media needs to be attended to. Posts need to be placed. If, if we're gonna get noticed and get busier and get more people to, to watch, we need to be making the right noises in the right places, and I just don't have time to do it. The last time I went on Discord was yesterday to look up somebody's telephone number. The time before that was three months ago. I don't have time for it. I haven't posted a picture to Flickr or to Instagram in six months because I don't have time to do it. That was not, a th that was my thing. My bell ringer would just have rung the bell if the bell hadn't fallen off. So those things are killing me because I have to do as much of that as possible and it leaves precious little time to do the things that I'm here for, which is making the content and making it good. So I've decided that being circumspect about it and just letting you know the problem, and I have discussed this in the past, isn't, isn't doing it. It's, it's not enough. My, I have a hundred and I think four uh, Patreon members. Thank goodness and thank you so much. These guys uh, have, have supported me from day one and, and uh, they have just been fantastic. And the new folks that have joined, thank you also. I mean, I, I just appreciate it so much. But it's not enough for me to get this channel to the next level, to get this business to where it can self-sustain. I, I feel like I'm hanging on with my fingernails. And the, the two things that have shown this to me was, I got sick this week for a day, and it has thrown me a month behind, and I have no wiggle room to, to grow into. I mean, it's just, that's how on the edge this is. And secondly, the male situation. Not male as in M-A-L-E, 
M-I-A-I, how do you spell male? M-A-I-L, that situation. That, that should have been a warning. That should have been a, a clear sign that we were reaching, you know, when you have a chronic illness and it's a bad illness and it gets worse and worse, you get to a point where things unravel very fast. It's called decompensation. I feel like we've been holding bandages on this, <laughs> on this channel for five years. And the mail is, uh, it feels like a warning. It feels like a warning, a kick in the pants to do something. And I, and I am gonna do something. I need to hire somebody and I can't pay them because I can't pay me. I am going to figure my part out. I'm not worried about that. I don't, I'm not going to ask for anything for me. But I am going to ask you, as some of the uh, 20,000, 20, yes, uh, I, I almost said 200,000. That, <laughs> that would be a nice problem. As some of the 20,000 people that regularly watch my content, I need you to hire somebody for me. I really do. I, I need somebody that, that's good enough, intelligent enough, maybe experienced enough, who can come and do live streams, who can do the tech part of a live stream, who can help with filming, who can answer the important messages, who can make sure that business opportunities that could have been bringing money in all along aren't sitting in an inbox for six months, which is happening now. Somebody that can bring the pieces together and free me up to do what I'm here for, the creative part, the photography part. I need you to pay for them. And that person in this area will cost about, I think for a good person, $40,000. For a, for a really good person with experience, probably closer to 50. There will be some benefits that I would need to, to give them, to get to attract them. And uh, I don't have any myself, so I don't know how I qualify for uh, giving them to somebody else, but I'll figure that out. We're going to say that, it's, that that's the amount of money. But I'm also going to say that if we can get somebody and if you can hire them for a year, between the 20,000 of you, if you can chip in enough to pay that person's salary for a year, by the end of a year, I am confident that we will pick up enough sponsorship or enough paid work just on the basis of the improvements in the channel to where we won't need that anymore. I am confident that supporting you know, my employee or employees will happen. Right. So how much is that? Well, I did some mathematics, so it's very probably wrong, but let's say we're going with 50, 50K. That is $1,000 a week that I need to come up with, $1,000 a week. Currently, I get about $1,200 a month through Patreon and uh, couldn't, couldn't do without it, absolutely couldn't do without it. In order to, to make up the difference, I can't, I can't lose the, 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 the fixed amount that I get because that goes straight to the, the, the fixed costs that have to be paid. So it would be in addition to that. That's, so we're looking at a shortfall of $1,000 a week or $4,000 a month, which sounds like a massive amount of money until you, until you think that that's only 100 out of 20,000 people who step up and say, okay, I'll do that for 40 bucks a month. I'll write a check for that, for you to do that for, for a year and, and sign up and, and do that. If a hundred of you did that, I would hire this person, whoever it is, tomorrow and, and things would start to change. If it was 200 of you could do it, it would be 20 bucks. These days, you can't buy a loaf of bread for well, it's $14, I think, I researched. $20 is not that much money anymore. Well, it is. It's a huge amount, but could you do it? That's what I'm asking. I hate doing this. 
But, yeah, I, w I would hate not doing this more. So, that's it. That's, that's everything. I'm not going to uh, drag it out. We'll, we'll say for, for 12 months that, that we'll try it. If at the end of 12 months it's, it's, it's not made a difference, then, then you know, we'll, we'll come up with a plan D or we'll scrap the whole thing. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of, of doing 10 times as much work as I need to to turn out content that's half as good as it should be. Um, so this is this is I the only way I see that we can we can pull this thing uh, uh, back from the brink. So are you in? Will you do it? Think about it. If you are, please go to Patreon and uh, and sign up. I am going to start um, listing the names of uh, all of my supporters, but particularly everybody from this day forth who either signs up or increases their current pledge to cover this 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 need i am going to list those people at the end of every video and every live stream so your your name will be appeared you will be known as one of the 200 like those gladiators that chopped each other up so if you want to be part of that please do i could use the help all right, I think that's enough. That I had, I had more to say, but I don't think it's going to work. So we'll, I, I don't think I'll get it out. We'll instead go with uh, plan B, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to check out a lens. Let's do that, because that's important and it's useful. And, uh, and uh, by the end of that, I'll be able to, to uh, read what's coming through on the, on the chat. Now... When you get a lens, and I don't even have my EL Nikkor, which I had here and then I carry to the back for something I forgot to, to bring back. But when you have a lens, let's say you have an enlarger lens. I'll get a dummy enlarger lens. Let's say you've got a lens, and the one I had was particularly difficult because it had some issues with it. But you've got a lens, somebody gives to you and says, hey, use this as a macro lens. And you look at it and you say, yeah, it's an enlarger lens. I could, I could possibly use that backwards. It's a 50 millimeter lens, say f2.8. Let's say even that it's made by Minolta. Would you excuse me for just a second? I need you to cover your ears. <laughs> Sorry, allergies. I'm allergic to asking for money. So um, you, ha you have this uh, enlarger lens. Uh, you, you think that probably an enlarger lens uh, that's a nice flat field lens would be good turned in reverse. So you think, well, I'll try that out. Let me tell you what the steps are. If you want to thoroughly evaluate that lens to know whether or not you can use it as a macro lens, there are some things it has to do. There are some qualities it has to have, and you need to test for them. Um, and the first thing that you need to do, unless you're me, is you need to research it. Uh, there will usually, but not always, be lots of stuff on the internet about the lens that you're looking for. Excuse me, that was a telegram message just came through. Um, somebody, uh, somebody asks if, um, uh, if Kickstarter would be an option. Uh, it probably wouldn't be, no, because I'm not making a product. I am making a product, but it's me. Uh, so it probably wouldn't be. This is my, my version of Kickstarter in that, yeah, uh, uh, I'm, I'm asking people to extend a little to, yeah. Um, so I, I don't think it would be. We can talk about that more later um, when... Um, when I've had a chance to think of a, a, a better response. I'm, I'm actually in the process of working up a Kickstarter for an actual product that I'm hoping that, that will, will make a difference. And, and, and it, doesn't, it wouldn't fit in this situation. Back to the lens. 
The problem, let me tell you about the problem with the lenses, Two, twofold. First, there's not much written about it. Usually there would be. And that would be the first thing that you would want to do is read everything you can get your hands on. Who's used this lens? Who's used it in reverse? What do they say about it? What kind of rev reviews does it get? Look on the, the coin imaging, the stamp imaging, macro uh, insect imaging sites. Look on my site, see if I've written about it. And, and get an idea of what other people think about it. Now, I don't do that because I'm almost certainly be going to be using the experience as a teaching uh, experience for you guys. So I don't want to know what other people have said about it yet. I want to test it first. So in, in most cases, you would go ahead and do the research first. The second thing you need to do is get the lens prepared to mount on your camera because you're gonna be taking a whole bunch of pictures with it. And in this case, it was problematic. Now, it was problematic because the end of the lens did not have a thread where a filter would go, which is a very bizarre situation for, a Mac, for a, uh, an enlarger lens. And this was an enlarger lens, it was a Minolta. Uh, it was a Minolta CE Rockor X, um, 50 millimeter f2.8 and uh, it did not have a filter thread. It had a smooth uh, edge, and I presumably a filter would slip fit on the end of it. Now, this was, this was problematic because of course, I don't wanna slip fit somebody else's lens on a macro setup that I'm not holding because I don't wanna drop somebody else's lens. So, um, or my lens for that matter. So I had to come up with a way to mount this thing in reverse where it could stay for a couple of hours for me to do all the pictures. And um, uh, normally what I would do these days is I would 3D print a housing for it where it would have a slip fit and it would mount in reverse inside uh, a plastic tube that would then have a reversing ring either 3D printed onto the end or somehow mounted with a 3D, uh, with a uh, regular reversing ring. And that would fit on my uh, camera or on my extension tubes. In fact, in almost every case when I'm testing a lens, it would be on bellows. Uh, and then I would go through the various magnifications and, and, and check it. Once you have it mounted, that's only the beginning of the, uh, of the process, of course. You've got a lot of uh, different things you're gonna do. But in this case, I didn't have time to 3D print it. I forgot, I keep forgetting that 3D printing a new design takes designing it, drawing it, printing it, and the printing it can be all day. So um, I had to come up with another way. And this is, this is something that I do a lot. And uh, if there's any interest, uh, I'll show you at the next live stream how I systematically find the right pieces. But generally, I open up my box of, of uh, uh, step up and step down rings, which have all my adapters in there. And what I do is I construct a tube out of step up and step down rings that is longer than the lens. And I will mount the lens inside that tube using loose adapters on the inside that, that, that go inside the tube but aren't screwed to anything. But when you tighten down the outer part of the tube, it snugs them together and holds the lens on the inside, self-centering right in the middle of the tube. I've never met a lens that I couldn't mount that way. But it's fiddly and it takes a while to do. And uh, this one was, was difficult. But you will always find a way, if you've got enough adapters, that you can mount one in front of it, one behind it, sometimes two or three, put the whole thing in the tube and tighten the tube a little bit and you'll see the lens moves to the center and holds it in position. I, it would have been a great demonstration because you would have seen I had 27 individual pieces screwed together to do that and it worked. You could probably do it by jamming it in a, a piece of PVC as well, which would be quicker, but I like the the, the screwing the bits together, it's fun. All right, so what are we gonna do once we've got the thing mounted in reverse on the bellows? Well, we're using it as a macro lens, so we're not using it as an enlarger lens. If you were, you'd do some enlargements with it, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna photograph something with it. What are we gonna photograph? 
What I like to photograph is, you know those things that you get that they, they're like this before you cut them up. They're, they're, they lean, they're, they're wedge shaped and you use them to test lenses with. You stick them on a surface and they'll give, they give you depth of field and things because they're at an angle. Right, you buy one of those and then you cut it up with scissors because what I'm interested in is pieces of this. In fact, that's not true. It's pieces of this, this part of it right here. I'm gonna to switch to the other camera and see if that will uh, show any better what I'm trying to say here. It, it ought to. Z, oh no my goodness, that doesn't look right at all. There we go. So this is the part that, that uh, I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Are you there, Alan? Well, that's a bit on the bright side. Let me see if we can fix that. This is the type of thing that I think, um, yeah, having a little techie help would be good with. So there we go. I take something like this and I position it at the, the focal distance for the lens at that magnification. And uh, I start taking photographs of it. Now, usually I will use um, a, a very standard process of, uh, you, you can never get these things flat. Even when you, uh, even when you go to great lengths to mount them on, a, on a, a very flat surface, maybe that will help a little bit. Let me try one other thing. Um, even when you mount them on a, an incredibly flat surface, they, they're never completely flat and your photograph is going to have areas that are in focus areas that are out. So what you end up doing is taking a series of photographs at different uh, depths by, by uh, using a focusing rail and just basically shooting a stack, a short stack. And then what I do is pick the, the sharpest. Um, now it's very important when you're doing test shots that you turn off every correction that you have in your camera and every correction you have in Lightroom or whatever you're using when you import the pictures into the computer because a lot of them will get rid of some of the stuff that you need to see like the chromatic aberration and uh, some of them will even uh, fix geometry problems. So you, what you need to do is begin at the lowest possible magnification, which for something like the, the EL Nick or enlarger lens or this, the one that I was using, and I can actually show you some pictures. Um, the minimum, let me pull this up to the top here, the, the minimum uh, magnification was about 1.4X. Now, why is that? Because I'm using bellows. Uh, when, it, when you're using bellows and you only have, um, you only have so many, uh, uh, so much distance that you can um, uh, separate the, uh, the the sensor and the lens by, and some of it's taken up by the collapsed bellows. You're on extension to begin with, so 1.4 is is uh, as low as I could get. How did I know it was 1.4? Well, because I, I measured it, and that's the whole uh, uh, key to this. The first thing you do is you photograph uh, a ruler. Not, not a ruler as in a, um, hang on, I'm gonna switch to a, the right screen here in just a second. Trying to uh, juggle quite a few plates here. So the first thing I do then is, is I uh, switch to a, um, a, a, a ruler. In this case, I use the printed ruler that's on the, the card that I'm using. And uh, I just uh, measure it to make sure that uh, uh, I, what my magnification is starting out. In this case, this was, wasn't the first picture I took. Using an APS-C camera, each of these is half a millimeter in length. So from five to six is 20 um, uh, subdivisions. So these are 20ths uh, of, uh, of a millimeter. And we've got one, two, three, four. So this is uh, but one uh, and two, this is 12 uh, millimeters or half of the full frame sensor width. So I know that uh, we are two to one with this. This was the second set of pictures that I took. And that's what you do to document. And what I do is I take the pictures, all of them in order, so that, um, hang on, let me find the um, list here. I take them all in order so that uh, as I go through the, the results, I can look at the first thing I see is the, is the ruler that I measured, 
and then I will see the, the, the actual photographs that I took with it, so that I always know what my magnification is. In this case, this was the, the, the final magnification, and I didn't go any higher than this because of the diffraction. In this case, we've got, um, uh, this was 4x, uh, four times magnification. So what are we looking for in the pictures? Well, what we're photographing is the square pattern let me show you the minimum um, magnification, the first one I did. We're shooting that little square, whoops, square pattern that shows up uh, on this card that I cut up. And it's actually not a, a very good target to use because the edges are a bit scrappy, uh, but it's not bad. It could, it could be worse, and there are some sharp edges to look at. Now, um, what we're looking for is geometric uh, issues like barrel or pincushion distortion, which you will frequently see in cheaper lenses where the edges are bowed in or bowed out, uh, the former being uh, pincushion, the latter being barrel. Uh, in this case, this lens was actually really nice uh, in terms of correction of geometry. Uh, it was nice and flat. Uh, it didn't have any uh, issues at all. Uh, the, um, the, the piece of paper wasn't completely flat because there, were, uh, some, there was some drop-off in focus on the right. Uh, but uh, it's important to bear in mind that uh, you, you need to, to be shooting at a chosen um, uh, uh, aperture size. In this case, I chose 5.6, and I did the whole series of tests at 5.6, and I would repeat them as needed. But remember that at 5.6, you are going to be diffraction limited eventually. And uh, in this case, the diffraction was getting pretty visible at um, uh, F4, uh, I beg your pardon, at um, a magnification of four times. So I didn't go any higher than that. But what you're looking for in addition to the geometry is you're looking for uh, softening or, or loss of focus that has a pattern, a loss of focusing, a focus at the edges or softening at the edges, and global softening across the, whole, across the whole field. And of course, you're also looking for color issues. Uh, chromatic aberration is, uh, now let's go to some of the higher magnification pictures so that I can show you what, what bad chromatic aberration looks like. Uh, the other thing that I do, of course, um, uh, is, is take some photographs of things. And in this case, I like, like computer chips for this. Uh, because they are perfect for, for everything that I've just described, for measuring, for looking at geometry, but they're great for uh, um, uh, chromatic aberrations. Not this particular one. I showed this because this is not the, the kind of chip you want, one that's covered in amber glass like this, because it's hard to uh, see the fringing. It's there, but it's harder to see. So I took a lot of uh, pictures at a, a of uh, the lower magnification ones, it's a little easier to see. Let me open up one of them. That was 4x, by the way. This is um, 2x, the second set I took. And um, what you're looking for are uh, longitudinal chromatic aberration and lateral chromatic aberration. Uh, it's a bit beyond the scope to get into exactly uh, how the two are differentiated. And most lenses that, that have one are gonna have some of, of both. Uh, not always, uh, but, uh, but could well have. This, by the way, is not a stacked image. This is a single image, uh, which is why part of it is, it is out of focus. Um, but when you're looking at uh, lateral chromatic aberrations, you'll normally expect to see them towards the edges. Uh, they'll normally be the classic uh, uh, fringing, the red uh, and green fringing on either side of high contrast vertical lines. Um, and uh, they're pretty recognizable. Uh, the um, longitudinal are a little harder uh, to, uh, to identify, especially when they're mixed in with lateral. And that they're generally seen in relation to areas of focus. You'll see the aberration coming and going as you pass through focus for the part of the image that you're looking at. It's really hard to describe, and none of these show classic examples of either, though both have color fringing throughout. 
so th this lens was was pretty limited by the uh, by the amount of uh, chromatic aberration. In fact, at higher magnifications, you could even see it on the um, checkerboard pattern, though not quite as clearly. Some of the pictures showed it worse than others, but that's the four times magnification. Uh, and you could see diffraction was becoming a real issue here. That was actually sharp in the viewfinder, um, relatively so. So once you've been through the whole sequence from start to finish and you look at them in order, you can put your, your thoughts down uh, in a systematic way for each magnification. And here, here's the most important part that, that I, I seldom think to, to mention, but it is the most important part to me, is I go back and I look at other lenses that I have tested that I know to be good. Uh, for example, the, the uh, EL Nikkor, uh, or if, if you were lucky enough to have a printing Nikkor, say, a, a 105 millimeter printing Nikkor that's in pristine condition, it's a reference lens. I mean, you can measure everything to that. And I would look at my four times magnification in the corners with the EL Nikkor 50 f2.8 with the, the same type of target and compare the two. And, and, and as you do that more and more with different lenses, you'll start to get a feel for, for what bad chromatic aberration looks like and what the difference between the longitudinal and lateral are and, and what effect it's gonna have on your actual photographs. Sometimes I'll see fairly significant, um, fairly significant uh, uh, chromatic aberration in the test shots on the grid, for example, and then not much in the pictures. The pictures don't look that bad. And I, I will you know, rate that lens accordingly and either use it or not use it accordingly. Um, th there's not a lot you can do about it uh, if, if you have it. Um, uh, if you have those, uh, those findings, that's what your lens does. That's the, the performance of the lens you have. There may be some magnifications you would choose not to use it at. Uh, certainly, it's why I really don't go above three, three and a half times magnification for any enlarger lens. They're not really good at that. Uh, not when used in reverse. They, they tend to, uh, to start to act a bit wonky uh, above three and a half. So that's, um, that was my motor, just did its thing again. I'm, I'm trying to time how often it does that, but I keep forgetting to look at my watch. So, um, so that's what, what I did in this case. Um, you get uh, uh, all kinds of mixes of, of chromatic and ge geometric aberrations, but normally the way it goes is this. With a beautiful lens, with a, with a printing Nikkor, or, or one of these uh, uh, Rayfac lenses, the, the new version of the, of the old uh, uh, EL Nikkors, you end up with nothing. You end up with, with no abnormalities. You end up with a fully corrected uh, lens that is a joy to, to use and it will photograph anything that you want it to. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, you'll end up with something uh, that you just shouldn't have wasted your time trying to mount on your camera in the first place. Uh, and uh, everything else is gonna fall somewhere in between and it's entirely up to you what your threshold is as, as most people get a bit better at this, they, they become less tolerant of lenses that, that you know, don't give you what you're looking for in terms of quality, and you can't, can't be blamed for that. That's the whole point of learning how to do it. So I am going to uh, spend, there's no, no way I'm opening these beetles with uh, three minutes left uh, on the clock. I had a lot to say today, and... Um, yeah, I, I got the important stuff said. We'll save the beetles. That you know, my son harvested these off sunflower seeds. He's a tall guy, and he planted some sunflowers that grew like 18 feet tall. And my son's not 18 feet tall, not not close to it. He couldn't even see the flowers; they were so high above his head. And anyway, they got infested with these beetles, and he put out a bag trap. Do you know what that is? It's a bag that traps beetles, and in one night, he filled the bag. It takes me a summer to catch three of a nice beetle. He filled the bag overnight. 
Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm have no doubt we'll get more if we need them. But I think I'll save these beauties. Maybe I'll photograph one later on today, and then we'll get uh, a prep done uh, at the next uh, live stream, possibly. So let me see if there's any questions and things. I've heard the telegram going ding a ling. Hopefully not telling me that there's no volume or um, something like that. Um, somebody needs my help. Dal, um, I have a Fuji XT4. And I'm building a guide of moths of Uruguay. I've already done it. Don't do that. I've already written that book. I haven't really. I'm just joking. Which lens would you recommend for a 2 to 3x for the moths? What a great question. Are these tiny, tiny moths? I think um, if you're looking for 2 to 3 times magnification and you're, you're using a, a Fuji uh, X-T4, I use a Fuji X-T2, myself on the on the microscope i think i would use either a um a Leowa 100 millimeter uh, f 2.8 the two times magnification the Leowa um 40 millimeter i think it's 40 could be 30 the 2.5 to 5 times magnification if the moths are really small if it was me though and i was photographing these in the studio, not in the field. If I was in the studio, I would buy the best uh, EL Nikkor um, 50 millimeter f2.8 that I could lay my hands on. 2.8 N, that is the N version. That would be the best for giving you the full range of magnification in the studio. Bright, clear, flat field, fantastic. Perfect for a, uh, for a guide where you want clarity above all else. That's what I would probably do. Um, if, uh, yeah, if you're going to be doing this in the field, then go with one of the, the, the camera lenses that will give you 2x if you need it. So the, probably the, the more flexible would be the, the um, 2.5 to 5x layer. Not an expensive lens, but beautiful. Uh, and uh, my friend Robert Thompson, um, who's doing a, a thing with Novaflex later on this month that I'm going to uh, um, tell you about later. Um, he um, uh, uh, got his hands on two um, uh, Leowa lenses and told me that if he had had access to these lenses before he bought his Nikon um, uh, 105, he wouldn't have bought it, he didn't think. That's how good they are. He thinks they are the, the best macro lenses out there. And that's a guy who actually makes his living doing this. Not somebody who just talks about it like me. He actually makes a living taking pictures uh, of, of bugs. So that's, um, th that's worth thinking about if you're getting ready to buy a lens. I love the EL Nikkor. Would it need a bellows? If you're going to use it to, to full... Um, no, it doesn't need a bellows. You can use it with some extension tubes. Uh, the bellows give you an infinite ability to adjust magnification. I'll put one of these beetles um, in front of an EL Nikkor, and then I will rack the bellows to get the subject to where it's exactly the size I want for the composition. I kind of back my way into it. So a bellows is nice. But if you don't want to invest in a bellows, don't have a bellows available, then uh, absolutely just use extension tubes and uh, you know keep use small pieces or use a helicoid, which will allow you to change the length. Remember <coughs> that um, you're starting out with about 100 millimeters from sensor to the reversed EL nickel, and your useful range of, of extension is only about 150 millimeters uh, between your minimum uh, magnification and the most you want to use, three and a half or four X. So uh, yeah. Uh, is the non-N version of the EL Nickel bad? No, it is not. It is not bad. It is not as good as the N. I have two of each. The Ns have better, more modern coatings. They're less susceptible to flare. Um, they are a little bit flatter, I think. But they are the, the, the non-N version is beautiful as well. And if I didn't have both, I wouldn't know the difference. So, yeah, and you can pick up the non-N version for next to nothing. The Ns are expensive now compared to when I bought mine. They were 20 bucks when I bought mine. They're twice that now. Um, 
I would recommend the N every time. You'll just be happier if you do, um, I think. Um, uh, Walter bought one for a Canon and uh, the Canon to Fuji adapter. You don't need an adapter because you're never going to use... I mean, if you're using it the way I use it, all you need is the filter thread. It doesn't it, it have a camera specific. There's nothing Nikon about it. Uh, it it's just um, uh, you'll use a... The reversing thread is 40.5 millimeters is the filter thread size. And that goes onto whatever mount you have. Um, uh, because you re you'll reverse it, so uh, yeah, you, it's very inexpensive to mount, and if you'd, you you'd have to have the right uh, uh, thread adapter is all. Uh, there is no layer with two point five to five for Fuji film. Oh, I I'm sorry, I see what you're saying, Walter. Um, you were talking about the lens. Um, yes, there is not, um, and uh, you're using. That you're using the Canon one. Okay, sorry about that. I don't have that lens. Uh, I'll I'll be honest. It's one of the it's one of the ones that I borrowed for a a few weeks last summer, enough to to uh, discover I really liked it a lot more than I thought I would. But I don't have the lens, um, so um, yeah, I didn't realize that it didn't work on the Fuji. My bad. Pierre, uh, greetings, Pierre. Uh, you can also test lenses with slide targets. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. Uh, a laser soft imaging company makes them. You can test them with anything. I use transparency targets sometimes. I've got the Air Force targets. I've got all kinds of things. I like these because I can do my, my measurements, my grids and everything all with one piece of cardboard and I don't have to worry about breaking it. It doesn't matter. Whatever you're, you're using that's flat. Uh, Kim asks, is the, uh, no, I already uh, answered that question. Uh, that was Kim that was asking about which, which uh, version, N or non-N, to get. Get the N if you can. Um, I'm going to jump back up a little bit. Um, okay, so Mike says, uh, I looked at my 4X. I bought it from We Macro, and it's in, it is in an infinity optic that has a point one nine um, working distance. I assume that the distance from the camera sensor to the Raynox, no, no, um, that that would um, that would not be the case. If you if you bought it from We Macro and you think I'm thinking of the right lens, that is a finite objective. Um, I didn't know they had an infinity optic with a working distance of point. Are you sure you don't mean uh, a numeric aperture of uh, 1.9? Uh, if that is the case, then uh, you just need to find out what um, Amscope uses as their, uh, they, they will use the same uh, tube uh, lens uh, uh, focal length as, they'll, they'll use the same focal length for all of their infinity optics. I didn't know they made a, a 4X Infinity objective, uh, but honestly, if they do, I wouldn't buy it. And not, not, I wouldn't buy it, um, based on what I've seen of, of the other Infinity optics that they have. That, that 20 buck uh, finite objective is a standout lens. There's no reason it should be that good, but it is. Uh, I wish I could say that about uh, about the others, but I'll do some research on that um, and, and Mike can get back to you with a better answer. Uh, I honestly have not used it, uh, the, the, the one you're describing, and I'll, I'll research Wee Macro's website and everything, and I'll, I'll help you figure it out. But I'm betting they use a 200 millimeter um, uh, uh, tube lens, so you'll need a, a 200 millimeter either a camera lens of 200 millimeters that you can use as a tube lens. You could put it on the front of your 70 to 200, for example, and then focus that at infinity, and that would work. Or you can use some, some extension tubes and a 200 millimeter tube lens like a Raynox. Okay, that's almost certainly what it is. There are other co companies that use 160 or 180, but they're, they're few and far between. Most, most these days would use 200, okay? So that's your best bet. Maybe a Raynox 150. 
We are out of time, guys. It's 3.07, and I have run over. I haven't answered everybody's questions, but gosh, um, yeah, I think we've, we've covered a lot. And um, let me see. Michelle had an idea, and I d definitely don't want to uh, leave her out. Uh, Proud Liberal says, does Patreon take a cut? Yes, they do. Uh, they do indeed. And... Um, I could probably get a local teenage computer geek for a lot less than 50k. Yeah, I could. But what I need is way more than a computer geek. I need somebody who understands this, who's, who, can, who, who has knowledge not only with computers, but cameras and, and preferably macro. Somebody who can learn, somebody who can answer emails and, and, and get creative with, uh, with coming up with solutions. I need more of a... a a manager uh, than uh, than just a, a dog's body. Seriously, I mean it's somebody who who can who can do all of that. Um, if he doesn't need full time, could probably get a local teenage computer geek for a lot less. Than, yeah, uh, I do, and I don't know if I need full time. But you know, if I'm asking for this, I might as well ask for what I, I think is going to be the best bet at, at knocking this out of the park. Trust me, I could, if there were four of me, I'd have trouble getting everything done. So it's, it's, it's going to be more a matter of, of using the resource as wisely as possible. But we've run out of time, and I'm not going to keep talking about that. I told you I'd talk about it one time and, uh, and ask, and that's it. It's been done. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, tolerating my absence on Tuesday. Um, uh, it was unplanned and I will see you this coming Tuesday with something entirely different and great fun I'm sure and by Tuesday that app will be working and I will be reachable through that app okay great I hope to see you on Patreon and if you do sign up to Patreon come to the Pazoom on Saturday because we're going to be uh, we're going to be doing stuff Graham's going to be there demonstrating things See you. Thank you. Do you want to see the stump, the hole in my... No. Okay. Well, you didn't even let me finish the question. Mandible, I was going to say. The hole in my mandible. No, you still don't want to see it. Okay. Take care, everybody. Stay safe and be well. Thank you very much indeed for, uh, for doing the uh, duty today, Alistair. I do appreciate you, as always. I'll see you guys at a later date. Farewell. <laughs>